Hey, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, wow. Um, I, I, I knew that this was a timely topic back when I booked uh, uh, Professor McDonald and back when I started to think about the speakers for the series this year. I knew this would be an interesting topic, but I, I didn't know exactly how, how interesting it was to come. So, um, Thank you all for coming. Uh, this community has always had a tremendous uh, response to library programming, and, uh, and I really appreciate it. Um, this is the first in a series of lectures that we're doing this year that we're calling Scholar for Life. Uh, we did a four of them last year, and this year um, we're kicking off with Professor McDonald. Uh, next up, there's a, there's a flyer in the hallway with, uh, with a, that schedule um, of the lectures. Next up is uh, Kathy Kramer the author of um, The Politics of Resentment, uh, Scott Walker and the Rise or, yeah, Scott Walker and the Rise of Rural Consciousness. So uh, another very timely topic on uh, May 11th. So uh, we also have, as you've probably seen, a full spread of uh, all the events that we have coming up in the next two months. Uh, April is absolutely packed um, with performances, lectures, um, events we're doing here, which is appropriate because April is National Library Month. Um, other thing I want to mention uh, before we get started, and what I, that I mentioned at all of all of our events here, is that the Friends of the Middleton Public Library, the, the nonprofit organization that, that supports the library, um, they are responsible for for funding all of the programming here at the library, whether it's for adults or for very little children. Um, David Reed, the uh, president of the Friends, is here had just asked to say something very briefly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're on. I'm on the board. Um, I, like Jim says, everything that's a program from the library is paid for through the Friends. Last year we raised $40,000 for events like this and for events for toddlers. Um, is there anybody brave enough to admit they're not a member of the Friends? <laughs> yes. You have a form in your Thanks, David. <laughs> so, um, as I said before, uh, this is the, the second year of uh, the lecture series that we're calling Scholar for Life. Um, this series has been something of a passion project for me. It's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, and we, we finally started uh, last year. Um, our kickoff lecture in February of last year, some of you may have been there, uh, we had to hold it at uh, City Council Chambers uh, because there was a problem with our roof almost caving in. Um, so uh, the mathematician Jordan Ellenberg um, was talking about giving a talk on math and elections, um, and it, that was like a couple weeks before Super Tuesday, so very, very timely again. Um, this lecture series takes the Wisconsin idea as its starting point, uh, aims, and aims to promote lifelong learning intellectual curiosity, and engagement between academics and the community as a whole. This talk tonight is brought to us by a unique four-way partnership um, that really reflects the spirit of the Wisconsin idea. Um, the first partner, the library, of course, um, we're hosting the event. Um, I chose the topics and um, invited um, all of the, the scholars here. Um, the UW-Madison Speakers Bureau, um, and Gwen from the UW Madison Speakers Bureau has been such an amazing partner in this uh, this lecture series. I won't signal her out, but she's here. Um, uh, the third partner in this uh, in this endeavor is, of course, Professor McDonald, who I'd like to note um, with appreciation is volunteering his time uh, to come and talk here tonight. <laughs> fourth element of this is you all. Um, everyone in the audience contributes um, by actively engaging with our speaker. Um, there will be time for, for Q&A um, afterwards, and, um, and with each other, of course, um, to build community. And uh, um, so uh, <laughs> I, without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, our guest tonight is the Alice D. Mortensen Petrovich Professor of History at UW-Madison, graduate of the University of Toronto and recipient of a doctorate at Columbia University, 
He teaches and conducts research in the history of the Russian Empire. In addition to teaching classes in his specialty, he has served as special assistant for athletics and chaired UW-Madison's Department of History. He also chaired the search committee that yielded Rebecca Blank, the current chancellor of UW-Madison. Please join me in welcoming David McDonald. Uh, thank you, Jim. I don't usually use a microphone, but I'll uh, see how it goes tonight. Can, you, can everybody hear me? Yeah. That's too bad. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, first, thank you all for coming out. Uh, it, uh, uh, I wish my class was enrolled at the, uh, at the rate and the volume that uh, this audience has. It's, uh, 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 it is yet to uh, reach uh, our students and their parents that uh, Russia might suddenly be relevant again. But, uh, um, but uh, tonight I want to talk for about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, I, I've only got about four hours of material here, so, uh, uh, and uh, if the crowd needs standing out, I can make it really tough. <laughs> or else uh, share my reflections on the fortunes of the Saskatoon Blades and Western Hockey League. Uh, but um, I'd uh, like to uh, start off with a couple of, uh, sort of prefatory statements, and then Going to, what I'm going to do tonight is, uh, is since the talk is uh, Ru uh, Putin's Russia from a historian's perspective, I'm going to be trying to sketch out for you what, how I make sense of the current Russian situation. And Putin is only part of the equation. And I, I, I'm going to argue, but only fleetingly, uh, quite a small part, or maybe a part that we're overestimating. Uh, and I'm happy, I'm probably not going to touch on everything that interests people. Uh, in, in the audience, so uh, I'm happy to answer Q&A uh, as long as, uh, as there are questions and as long as the, uh, uh, the utilities let the library lights stay on. But, uh, um, but uh, this is obviously a huge topic, topic of great currency. And so I'm going to consider the Russia that we have now, uh, and in the back of my mind is the Russia as it was in 2000, 2004, the, uh, the beginning of the century. Uh, <gasps> Back at that time, uh, when I was asked to go out to speak, it was largely to do with my role in athletics. From 2000 to about 2008, I would talk about uh, uh, how I learned to stop hating uh, intercollegiate athletics and to love it from the inside, right? But uh, uh, since then, it's been uh, the Putin show all the time. Uh, and back then, people could have been forgiven for wondering why somebody specializing in 17th to early 20th century Russia would still have a job, uh, let alone somebody uh, specializing in the history of the Soviet Union. We all knew, didn't we, that Russia was a done deal. Uh, Russia was a spent force historically. Uh, as recently as the last administration, we've heard Russia referred to as a second rate or a regional power. Uh, and this is not just a, a, a sentiment that we saw among uh, uh, what I call the secular world, among lay people and, and political figures. This is something that stretched into my profession. Very quickly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, a book came out in uh, 1992 uh, called The End of History by a, a political theorist named Francis Fukuyama, arguing that now with the end of the Cold War, all this contention over uh, liberal versus socialist values was done. The liberals had won decisively, and uh, socialism was spent force again. And so the Soviet Union, it, it, none of it mattered anymore. A colleague of mine in Russian history, a specialist on the period before Peter the Great, a uh, man named Marshall Poe, very able scholar, published in 2006 a book called The Russian Moment in World History, in which he said Russia had had this bizarrely successful three centuries on the global stage, and now it's gone, and didn't have to worry about it. Um, well, <laughs> she's back. <laughs> um, so, one thing that we've got to keep in mind, uh, usually I make a pitch for the university and, and, and saying that uh, we provide a really valuable social role that never gets discussed, I'm afraid, in that in a world that is life within uncertainty, and in every era it's right with uncertainty, right? Even during the Cold War, there were things, unexpected developments uh, that, that nobody uh, would have thought would have happened. And we live in a very unpredictable world, and the university is an incredibly inexpensive and productive way of maintaining a store of, it's like a hedge against the unknown. That 
no matter what the what the area, whether it's Africa, whether it's Central Europe, whether it's South America, uh, economic development model, anything you need to know more about, our university has somebody who can tell you about it. And somebody who's devoted their life and their passion, their energy to studying it and making that their calling. And that is something we don't know we have until we need it. And so the, the, the case of Russia, for selfish motives, uh, provides me with a great illustration of the role that we can play, even as we're teaching your children and grandchildren uh, history, uh, ways of thinking about history, ways of thinking about their world, ways of processing knowledge, ways of interpreting new information and expressing conclusions about it to different types of audiences and different media. None of these are skills that they're going to be able to do without whatever calling they choose, uh, uh, from the legal profession to medicine to uh, sales. Right? The, these are all valuable skills, but more substantively, um, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, uh, how has Putin made Russia great again? Uh, I don't know where I got that phrase from. Uh, and, and what's interesting, especially to me, especially to a child of the Cold War who got into the study of Russia by trying to explain to myself uh, questions that the Cold War had provoked in me, um, why has the new Russia, this Russia that's really taken shape over the last 15 years, uh, taken a form that allows us, or that really leads us, almost involuntarily, to respond to it in terms that we haven't really heard since the end of the Cold War, right? It's, uh, the sort of, uh, it's, not a, it's a superpower to the extent of nuclear weapons, but it's become sort of this pervasive threat, right? Syria, uh, the partnership with China, uh, dealing with North Korea, bellying up to the table in negotiations with uh, uh, over the Middle East. We should, uh, one of the better kept secrets in uh, in our press and in our general consciousness is that uh, the Russian government and President Putin have formed a great relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu. Yes. I, sure. I heard it down yes. slightly because it was feeding back. That's my hand is straight. But, uh, <laughs> um, and what does it look like now? It looks to us like an authoritative or maybe authoritarian state that has become increasingly assertive, has established, has reestablished itself self consciously as a rival, direct rival with the United States, seeks recognition as a world power, and we see it sort of spreading its stuff in the Olympics at Sochi, fantastic demonstration of Russian cultural achievement to the world. Uh, it seemed at the time also impressive athletic achievement, but this seems to have been assisted. <laughs> um, but uh, following on that with the, uh, with the seizure of the Crimea, uh, we, so more recently we've seen Russia assume a very active role in the Syrian conflict, and that the maelstrom that's becoming. And they're in on every international negotiation that involves multilateral partners, and partly through their seat on the Security Council in the United Nations but also through direct, great, uh, direct power brokering. Now, from the perspective, from my perspective, as a historian really of the Romanov years, the, the, the last three centuries of the old <coughs> Russian Empire, I, I can tell you I see much that is very familiar. Uh, largely, the, what I would call the conceptual framework or the rhetorical framework uh, of politics and the assumptions and rhetorics that seem to drive Russian political discussion, political motivations, uh, but at the same time, since about 2008 to 2011, we've also seen new adaptations or tweaks on these older forms. Uh, 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 partly, well, as somebody who studies pre-revolutionary Russia, I'm going to be inclined to see continuity. Right? And part of what I want to do is discuss what's old, what's new, and how you get from one to the other, and how they form this really interesting in doing it, it's going to sound like I'm trying to normalize Russia in a way I am. Uh, too often, we, when we're thinking about uh, this, by the way, we do not do this with China. And we do not do this with a lot of other powers. But Russia, in our imaginary, and this is a, a, a way of thinking about Russia that we inherited from the Brits, who <coughs> first developed it in the 1830s. Uh, this is the Russia that appears in popular literature as Mordor, or as the uh, Star Wars Empire. Uh, Klingons, maybe, uh, but only in the first series. Uh, but uh, uh, but 
Um, I and so when I try when I treat this as a normal system, and I hope you understand how I get there, I'm often told that I'm apologizing for or sticking up for the system. I'm not. I'm trying to understand a system that we cannot leash from sight commands tremendous loyalty and love from its citizens. Citizens who, like we are, often critical of certain attributes of the system that but still identify with something they see as ineffably Russian, ineffably theirs, something they're part of, and something that frames their life. And to them is normal. And I don't think I think that until we start understanding that fact, until we start stop treating the, the Russians like they're a victim of some sort of mass psychosis or some other pathology, and notice we often use pathological terms to describe them, or we describe them as abnormal or unnatural. Look around a map of the world, you look at the political orders that are in place around that map. Uh, if I were a statistician, I'd tell you who the abnormal countries were. I'm glad to live in them, but uh, nonetheless. And so I think we, a lot of what, and this goes back to the Cold War as well, a lot of our discussion about Russia is a sort of a, a hurt and reproachful sense that they refuse to become and that tells us about us. It doesn't tell us anything about Russia. Okay, so enough for the preamble. Um, I want to start with several citations that I want you to keep in mind as I go on to whatever time allows me for the rest of the discussion. And I'm going to ask you which one does not belong with the other. Two, there are two people speaking. One is different from the other. Uh, one person says, the opponents of Stagewood would like to choose the path of radicalism. The road to liberation from Russia's historical past. A liberation from cultural traditions. They need a great upheavals. We need a great Russia. Second one. Russia was and will remain a great power. It is preconditioned by the inseparable characteristics of its geopolitical, economic, and cultural existence. They determine the mentality of Russians and the policy of the government throughout our history, and they cannot help but do so now. But Russian mentality should be expanded, continued quote, by new ideas. In today's world, a country's power is manifest more in its ability to develop and use technologies and ensure a high level of well-being, protecting its security and upholding its national interests in the international arena. That is its military strength. Uh, Russia will not become a second edition of, say, Great Britain, where liberal values have deep historic traditions. Our state and its institutions and structures have always played an exceptionally important role in the life of the country and its people. For Russians, a strong state is not an anomaly to be gotten rid of. Quite the contrary, it is the source of order and the main driving force of any change. Which one doesn't belong? How many vote for number one? How many vote for number two? Number three? <laughs> it's actually number one. Number one was uh, part of a very famous speech by a Russian prime minister named Fyodor Stalipin, and he's speaking to a Duma, in the second Duma, after the revolution of 1905, uh, a parliament was convened, sort of at gunpoint, by Nicholas II. Uh, he dissolved the first one, the second one was due to be dissolved about three months after Stolypin gave this speech. And when he's looking at defending some people, he's going, some people want great disturbances, we want a great Russia, we need a great Russia. He's looking at all these Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, whose houses his secret police are, are searching at the time he's saying. But Stolypin is also an incredibly interesting model for Vladimir Putin. I won't pursue it for you, but I only brought him in to show you that there's a certain resonance in the political rhetoric of, of 1907. And the other quotes I got from a speech, it was Putin's maiden speech to the nation after his uh, introduction <clears throat> as acting president between Christmas and New Year's of 1999. And you can find it's called... Uh, uh, Russia on the eve of the new millennium. You can find it online. Uh, it's an extended reflection. It's probably, I think, still the clearest guide to sort of the bedrock principles of Putin's thought and of the, the, the vision that drives the sense of uh, statecraft. Now, as I suggested, I see a great deal that's familiar to what I call the old, the traditional, the continuities in Russian history. Um, and we see in Stolypin's speech, and if it's also in the, more fully developed in Stolypin's whole speech, but certainly in Putin's remarks, uh, we see the signal attributes 
of a certain approach to what I would call statecraft or a certain understanding of the state, right? Uh, the state is a guarantor of order. The state stands above society and acts on society. It's directorial, it's managerial. You might have heard that the term managed democracy in the first two sets of elections, especially towards the end of uh, of, of uh, Putin's first term. Um, and Russia's greatness, Russia's stature on the international stage is absolutely central to the political identity of Russia itself and also it seems the legitimacy and acceptability of the state. I'm going to play with these ideas very briefly now. Um, so Putin's state is mobilizer, it, it manages the economy, even as there are parts of the economy that are but the, it's very much like the Chinese economy. A lot of the sectors are state managed. We look at the oil sector, we know the media are, uh, we know that certain parts of highway regulation are, uh, not petty retail, which is probably the biggest difference from the old Soviet Union. The state's also the unifier. It stands as the embodiment of the nation, the national destiny. It's the definer of political direction. It holds a monopoly, really, on the prerogative of these things. The Duma, as it's now constructed, is a, uh, is a party that's an adjunct to the, uh, to the order of the state. Uh, we saw this with what they called the castling move between Medvedev uh, and uh, Putin in uh, 2012. And, uh, uh, and above all, the state is a guarantor of order. An order that's rooted in a historical awareness that I want to get to, too, because these people see themselves as part of a historical script or a part of a historical drama. And they have, as I'm going to suggest, since the 18th century. Uh, they, the, the state, as it currently stands, uh, which looks to us authoritarian, uh, looks to us quite uh, <coughs> controlling, uh, this type of statecraft is rooted in a tradition that took shape at the same time as the fathers of our understandings of liberal democracy and political economy were articulating the basis of our own sense of legitimate government. And here I have, uh, here for, so for our side, I would say the, the uh, people in the Scottish Enlightenment, Ferguson, Hume, Adam Smith, obviously, and uh, he'll, he'll come back to uh, he'll make a bow later on, uh, uh, but also John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, sort of the architects of the glorious revolution of the late 17th century, the precursor to your own revolution uh, a century later. Um, and both the Russian style of statecraft and our style of statecraft are rooted in the wrenching conflicts of the 17th century. On the continent, the wars of religion, especially the Thirty Years' War, that uh, almost destroy Europe until the pieces of 1648. And you know, on, in the British Isles, of course, the Civil War, uh, that saw the overthrow of Charles I, the installation of Cromwell, a uh, first sort of violent unification of uh, Scotland and Ireland with, uh, with, the, English, uh, with the English polity. And one thing that came out of this period was different countries found different ways to solve a new problem in state organization. How do you support standing armies? And how do you maintain <coughs> national security? And how do you find a way of dealing with social tensions, right? Whether it's conflict between peasants and nobles, uh, peasants and merchants, Catholics and Protestants, monarchists and uh, anti-monarchists. How do you find a way to accommodate and deal with these tensions? One of the things that very quickly becomes clear, is what Daniel Defoe, English thinker from later in the century, he will define as the long purse. That if you don't have money, you can't wage wars, you can't administer, you can't mobilize society, you can't put uniforms on your soldiers, uh, you, uh, you don't have anything in the bank with which to pay for the armaments and for the food and for the logistical support that you need to have to support an army that you need in a hostile political environment. Whether you're Cromwell in England, or whether you're Gustav Adolf in Sweden, or a king of Bavaria, or later on Peter, Peter Alexeyevich, whom we know as Peter the Great, in, uh, in Muscovy. Um, now, one way of understanding this, uh, this form of statecraft that's alternative to ours, ours is about you know, the way you solve the problem in long first 
can generate a lot of trade. This creates its own social ramifications, greater participation, greater broad interest in the operation of laws that will allow markets to flourish. And then we all learn how to think in the long term and to, uh, to live according to the law because we all benefit from it, et cetera. And it becomes sort of a high road to participatory democracy, right? But in other parts of Europe, they drew a very different lesson. And this isn't just Russia. This is the Germanys, which become Germany in 1871. This is the Austrian Empire. Uh, uh, this is uh, Sweden for a good period of its, uh, of its heyday. Um, and that is, how many of you know Thomas Hobbes? Uh, Thomas Hobbes, the uh, very, uh, very renegade political thinker of the mid to late 17th century, wrote a very famous book that we torture freshmen with in political <laughs> theory classes uh, called Leviathan. And Leviathan basically said, look, we're all equal, not because we're equally good or because we're uh, equally uh, able to that. We're all equal because any of us, under the right circumstances, can kill anybody else. <laughs> you gotta go to sleep sometime, right? Uh, uh, say, if I'm bigger than you, well, I'll go, you know, uh, you might go and get a couple of friends and wait till I'm uh, looking and jump, right? Uh, so, and that we all fancy ourselves potential masters of everything, which means that we live in a state of continual war. And if we live in a state of continual war, there's no order. And if there's no order, there's no things like markets, there's no things like property, there's no things like arts, there's no things like good food. There's, briefly, in this famous phrase, life, he's got a long set of adjectives describing misery, and then he says, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, somehow, we recognize, because somehow it's in our nature, we know we could be, we all agree to surrender our power to kill each other to this state. <coughs> and this state, to guarantee our security to do what's good for us, acts as our agent, but it has totally unlimited use of power over us and against our enemies. Now, this is based in a view of the world that uh, that we don't really share. None of us feel that grimly threat. In the 17th century, especially in Central Eastern Europe, a lot of people did. It also drafts very well onto a longer argument between monarchs and their aristocracy over where power should lie. Now, when you take this with the, uh, the getting of money, you get a state whose members start thinking of themselves as organizers. You want to make good conditions for merchants to create taxes, you want to have good conditions in which nobles can learn how, how to be good officers. You can you want sturdy peasantry whom you can draft into an army to serve a standing army. Uh, you become a marionetteer. You become the great manager. And you do it. Why? Because you have professional specialists sitting in chanceries uh, who know the science of accounting, who know the science of, uh, of fiscal management, who know the science of war. Uh, who've proven this, who were educated, they understand the larger perspective of the state's needs, which we call raison d'etat, better than these narrow social, confessional, political, or ethnic groups in society who can only see things from their own perspective. So they've got what we'd say the long view, right? The 30,000 foot uh, perspective. Um, and this becomes a justification for the concentration of pretty much absolute power, and this is what we call absolutism. That the monarchy, that the monarchy or the ruler has this grand mobilizational power over society. Let's not forget this works. Right? Like absolutism, I'd say it still exists in a recognizable form in post-Soviet Russia, and it morphed in a certain way in Soviet Russia from what it exists in Imperial Russia. But let's not forget, it exists in Germany until 1945, until we blasted Nazi Germany to smithereens and occupied it for how long and spent how much treasure, <coughs> the Marshall Plan, infrastructural reconstruction, all the rest of it. it. And it took a long time for them to be re-educated or be educated into traditions, parliamentary traditions, understanding like our own. Uh, they succeeded very well. One might say the same thing about Japan. Uh, so, my point here is that nothing unnatural about that, nothing abnormal. That this was a model of statecraft that did very well for its uh, for its exponents uh, for a long time, and nothing 
seems right to accept, right? That, that there's a learned behavior that becomes self-legitimating as it's repeated. Now, at the same time, this emphasis on external order and on international stature, because in Russia, well, not unlike, say, manifest destiny in this country, or in my mother country, the empire in which the sun never set, that our governments attach a great deal of their prestige and generate loyalty among us towards the grand, you know, these grand endeavors of nation building and empire building on their international success. Same thing happened in the Russian And we can tell this by what happens when they fail. And I could do two hours on how this happens, but I'll just say examples. Um, defeat or international humiliation can severely undercut the legitimacy of these regimes. Uh, in Russian history, the Crimean War in the 1850s led to a thorough set of root and branch reforms, the abolition of a form of slavery called serfdom, uh, reorganization of the whole government, uh, 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 institution of a representative form of government for localities, all designed to get Russia up to a capacity where it could compete internationally as they saw it, its, uh, its, its status. Uh, a failure in the war with Japan, in the old chosen war with Japan in 1904, led to a revolution that we often forget about, but that came within a hair's breadth of overthrowing the Romanov dynasty in the fall of 1905. Uh, world War One did bring an end to the Romanos, starting a hundred years ago next week, right? Yesterday, in the streets of Petrograd, a hundred years ago, 1917, women, <coughs> celebrating, ostensibly celebrating International Women's Day, but really on bread strikes, because of the shortage of provisions, went out on a march in which, which somehow morphed into a broader set of disturbances that lasted for four days before Nicholas II saw it was read the writing on the wall. I don't think he saw it himself. And so, in Soviet case, the conflict in Afghanistan helped to really undercut what was already a talking spiritual order. So, international failure is a very critical threat to these regimes. And so, there's a two edged sword to this aspiration to greatness. Now, this perspective on statecraft and on the state took root under Peter the Great. Uh, who ruled, say, 1696 to 1725, and his successors, who had already inherited a power that was founded in the divinity. Like, if you think George III claimed divine right, nobody believed him in Great Britain. I know nobody believed him and believed in it here. It was a convenient fiction for legal purposes to do with the way the, the British Constitution worked. Muscovites are, no, he had divine right. Uh, he was the, he provided over the last rump of true Christianity, the Russian Orthodox Church, and his job was to keep Russia safe till kingdom come. And that was always been counted historically. Um, Peter suffered a series of humiliating defeats against an army from Sweden. Uh, right, he was into the Vikings up in the land, I suppose. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in we think of it as the beginning of westernization. And I think this is, because I'm a fresh out historian, I'm also going to say it's much more complex process. I think it's much more interesting too. Russians, the educated Russian society, learned as a consequence the encounter with a vastly superior Swedish military power. Russians saw themselves in, in the elite circles, and Peter especially, they would have thought themselves as the spiritual center of the world in 1680. By 1710, they think of themselves as backwards, in this primitive, and as having got it wrong, and as being faced with the imperative of catching up. Because the other thing that comes with think, you know, realizing you're backwards is you buy another way of looking at the world. It's not your spiritual sanctity. It's not your, uh, your orthodoxy. It is where you stand on a scale of advancement. How rich are your people? How good are your weapons? How good is your army? Uh, what type of gross national or domestic product do you have? And say, how do you compare to Berlin, to Vienna, 
from Paris and London. Right? And again, in our way of looking at things, this would have been, you know, Adam Smith argued, well, you'd find uh, something that, in which you had some sort of competitive advantage because you were so similar. Right? So, uh, let's say Scotland wool exports or, uh, or uh, later coal exports. Right? And you use that to fund sort of cultural spread and specialization and development. And it leads again to this high road to participatory uh, democracy. In a place like Russia, and we see this later in China, Iran, uh, post Ottoman Turkey, the state becomes a historical agent. The state becomes the agent to pull society forward through time along a path that you can see traced by the more advanced powers. They did it by hook and by crook, or as they say, Newfoundland by guess and by gosh. You've seen it, so you know, and you've got the sort of the rational sight. You can plot how to advance. You can use your mobilization power, mobilizing power, to pull society forward through time till to use Stalin's phrase from the 1930s, you can catch up to and overtake the supposedly earlier advanced powers. This becomes a very powerful justification, now seen in historical terms, for a type of power that Muscovite and early Russian rulers had traditionally exercised. And it also becomes a way of defining a project around which you can rally your elites and reward them for their loyalty to the project. Right? So you can start seeing this complex emerge where it's this continual pursuit to restore Russian greatness. How are you going to measure it? Peter measured it in 1709 at the Battle of Poltava when he defeats his former his adversary Charles XII, defeats him soundly, and sees this as a real demonstration of Russia having arrived. Catherine the Great builds palaces, starts up the Hermitage Art Collection, to, uh, invites the most famous thinkers and writers from Europe at the time to her place. Soviet Union, which is a very similar approach to governance, but uh, uh, but stripped away is much more hard-edged. These are people who live, A, on the peripheries of their society, so they're not socialized into noblesse oblige and into gentlemanly manners, so like the noble bureaucrats of yore. Uh, and uh, they've also they've also learned the power of the state to be sent to Siberia and the like. They have a much harder edge view of it, but essentially it's the same same idea. How are we going to make modernity? How are we going to make the Soviet Union a leading state out of backward Russia? Right, and with them it's a lot it's a lot clearer. Um, and for the Soviet Union, their legitimacy and their success is proven by their defeat of Nazi Germany. Right? This, this grinding struggle of 30 million plus deaths on the Soviet side, it becomes, by the 60s, it becomes the great rallying point for patriotism. The one genuine, genuinely indisputable triumph. But again, what a triumph of Soviet science. There's not a few of them, right? Uh, their ability to acquire, by book or by crook, mostly the latter, uh, the uh, technology for the atom bomb. Uh, their mastery of the arts. Right? Uh, uh, the great musicians, Yaroslav yeah, Richter, uh, Rostropovich, the cellist. We still, uh, those of you who have opera, uh, the, the, the wave of uh, great sopranos and tenors and bassi that come out of Russia. These culture are famous. In the, uh, in the world I inhabit, the sports world, uh, Soviet athletes uh, dominated Olympics winter and summer. Right? Yeah. So the Canadians came back in and started playing hockey here. So. <laughs> uh, but these are all these are all sort of exhibitions of the state's capacity. So this is the type of statecraft I'm talking about. Now, that all falls apart in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and. It's the collapse of oil prices. There's a lot of other things. This is going to become occupied. I won't bore you with it. But, but we know. We all watched it. The demonstrations in the streets in 1990 and 91. That failed putsch, right? That failed coup d'etat in the summer of 91 when Gorbachev goes through the humiliation of being liberated by his nemesis, Boris Yeltsin. And then Christmas Day 1991, the red flag comes down over the Kremlin, being replaced by a tricolor that only covered Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Caucasian republics, the Baltic republics, Central Asia, they were all new states. 
And so this was the brave new world, right? This is what we've been waiting for during the Cold War. And we all told ourselves, well, now they're going to get it. Now they're going to go to democracy. Now they're going to go to participatory democracy. Why didn't that happen? Let me do a thought experiment for you. 1985, imagine me younger than I am now. Imagine me 40, 45 years old. Imagine yourself that age. And let's see, you're living in some provincial city. You've got a job. It's not a great job, but it gives you a reliable paycheck. You get good benefits through the factory. There's decent school for your kids. If your kids are gifted, you can send them to a special school where they learn English or physics or math or ballet or swimming or one other. But there's a relatively good educational system. The health system, as far as you know, is good. You go to the clinic, doctor takes care of you, gives you all the antibiotics you want, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you can say, well, my kid can get into the polytechnical school or the university, go into engineering, go into this or that. You can see a career path. You've got savings. You own your apartment. You paid minimal rent on it. Um, and there are things you don't like the government. You talk about that behind closed doors with your friends over vodka or over caviar or bad wine or whatever. But uh, uh, this is your life. You need something that the stores don't have. We know the stores don't have a lot. You've got connections. You've got your friends. And your, your whole life is spent in a cloud of friends, most of whom you've known since you were in nursery school or grade one. And it's the life you know. You turn on your TV, sports stars are doing well, the CSKA, the hockey team is doing, is uh, winning European championship. Your, uh, you can see uh, picture, footage of your uh, troops on maneuvers in Czechoslovakia, in Germany, in East Germany, right? You put on your old uniform on Victory Day, May the 9th, or if you're not, if you're not big, you'll march with your dad or your mom, everybody's family is touched by. This is a life. And you can plot your kids. Life is happy. 91, that all goes. 91, everything goes. Tremendous economic collapse. You, you, your connections can't find, you can't find your key, let alone talk. The school, you've got to bribe to get your kids into good class. Your doctor can't afford to treat you. Universities, people are leaving in droves, going west where people will pay them. Uh, and you're, and moreover, you live thinking, sure, there was crime in the street, but that was stuck in your neighborhood. It's just the cops were corrupt and that. Now you're watching on TV in a free press. You're seeing crime was endemic everywhere. High crime and low crime. You're seeing the rise of the mafiosi. And at the same time, you're seeing the step-by-step -step humiliation of your country. Your old friend Serbia, now this is a myth, but the, your old friend Serbia are getting bombed by the Allies. The Allies who... And I remember seeing a very prominent liberal leader, somebody who we get along with, complaining about this in an interview on German television. You guys can't bomb that area. That's a nice street. Or you've gone to at least consult that, right? Uh, Russia's weave, they were told that NATO wouldn't expand. What did it do? It expanded right to their doorstep. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, former Soviet Republic. Boom. Finland. Bound by treaty neutrality. Boom. Renounced. Austria. Boom. Renounced. Turns the EU. And Starting in Ukraine, the same time that Arab money <laughs> is going into the Caucasus and funding uh, the jihad that we never. We <laughs> <laughs> so heard about that, but, uh, <laughs> that we never really heard about. And, uh, and there's all these instances of bombings of that uh, all over the country. Then in 19, and who's presiding over? Resale. Yeltsin, who as we know, goes into an extended state of decline and becomes just as humiliating a symbol of your country as Brezhnev and Chernyanka had in the Jerome's years of the late 1970s and the mid 1980s. Plus more, culture, sports, your best artists are either living in the West, playing in the professional soccer and hockey leagues in Europe and North America, not coming back, Speak to us consumers. And when they come back for the Olympic team, they're lousy. They're losing. Your country's a laughing stock. And this is a country that Putin is addressing on New Year's Eve, 1999. Now, very quickly, 
So we can see how how can you have democracy? How can you have rule of law? And we all thought, let's give them money, let's give them constitution, let's design mechanisms to get them through what we call the transition. Transition what will all of this do? Transition to us. They got McDonald's there, how can they miss? <laughs> Russians talk my <coughs> Russian friends who were very cynical with this. They referred to contemptuous people who wrote such a Snickersization. The Snickers bars were advertising everywhere. And you saw, right at the time that all this stuff is befalling you, falling, you've got no right to protect you. Your parents are in your apartment because their pensions aren't indexed for inflation and are so meaningless that they can't afford to live on their own. They've sold all their own stuff, gathered around churches and on street corners with their stuff spread out. It's like, if you've ever walked up Broadway in New York and see guys selling used books, we're seeing this with personal belongings, family heirlooms. Right? All this is going on while you're also being bombarded with advertising with all these luxury goods that these very few oligarchs are able to buy. And you're watching those things on TV. So this is it. So how do you a population that had for years, not just so but before that, had learned how to live on the edges of the law? Had learned to rely on their cloud of friends, their connections, stuff you needed. It's when I I done my graduate work in New York City, lived there for nine years. I'd say I'm from good law abiding Canada. <laughs> and I saw this non cash economy, this, this unofficial economy, favors friends of mine who were supers of big buildings down in Midtown who were paid in cash. Right? Save the uh, save the management company, save them trouble filling out W-2s and tax forms and that. And, it, I mean, in Italy, we call them great, honey. In Russia, for the black market. Uh, these people had to survive, including in the planned economy, to succeed. You had to play over the edge. And the state would only intervene to punish you when they felt, when it was felt that you were doing it to the detriment of state interest. That you couldn't play with hard currency, with foreign currency. So that was voted. So how do you tell people who have lived regarding anybody they didn't know as a potential threat, and not just because of politics, this goes back to peasant culture in the 19th and 18th, 17th century. How do you say, well, we're going to have these retired, these people in retirement age wearing really nice black robes sitting in Moscow, and they're going to decide on the ultimate legality of what you want to do. And you're going to obey them. That doesn't sound normal. Yet, right? So we have and we don't ever reflect for ourselves what happened, what has happened in our society to create this deep respect for the rule of law, which we see now, that regardless of where you stand on the recent election. Uh, you know, the trap plates still work, the parking meters still work, we, uh, we pay our taxes, or most of us will, uh, unless we're smart, no. Uh, 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 but, uh, you know, we, we never ask ourselves, what was it happened to us to make us behave like this? And it isn't something that's on a piece of paper. It's a, for us, it's Magna Carta, War of the Roses, English Civil War, Glorious Revolution, your revolution. I, I recall you had a civil war in this country. Uh, it, really, when you look at what we consider democracy, 1215, to when's the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act, 64, 65, something that's natural took 750 years. 750 years and a lot of violence. And we were expecting these people to sort of trust the unknown as their whole known world was collapsing around them. We expect them to reach out and trust because we told them. Now what Putin's done, what, what's new in all this, right? Because we can recognize a lot of the sort of the, the outlook on the world and on foreign policy. I won't get into the Russian West thing because I think uh, there's, well, don't have time, but it's also a bit of a misnomer. Um, Putin, when he comes to power, he's a nullity. Nobody knows him. He's, uh, he's gone, he was, I actually have a very close friend who grew up two blocks from him in Leningrad. Not St. Petersburg. Actually, it was likely at Leningrad State University. The same semester I studied there with an American group who said 1975, fall of 75. Uh, he was a tough kid. You'd see these tough street kids and, and these brown <coughs> and stuff. Uh, and not too scary, but they beat up on each other. My, the first gang fights I ever saw were in downtown Leningrad. Uh, and 
But he had an item in chance, he went to law school, joined the KGB. This was a very respectable profession. I still recommend my students to the CIA and to other nameless agencies that well, all seem to pay very well. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a way if you're loyal to your country and a certain registered, this is a very honorable profession. He had a low level counterintelligence job in East Germany. Good posting, he had good rations, good beer, and you got to watch West Germany TV. Um, he comes back to Leningrad after the class, which then becomes St. Petersburg. He is a protege of a very prominent liberal politician, one of his law school profs, a guy named Anatoly Subchak. And he's by Subchak's side in the Leningrad resistance to the Putsch, the coup of August 91. And Subchak puts him in charge of sort of foreign relations in his, uh, in his kitchen cabinet. He rises to the rank, he's pretty capable. Uh, he comes to power. Yeltsin has sort of a revolving door of prime minister, as you might recall, the last two years of his government. And he happened to be <laughs> in musical chairs. He had the seat when Yeltsin decided I've had it with the president. <coughs> so it's Putin in charge. And Putin has a great deal of personal popularity. It's the one thing nobody ever tries to explain outside of saying it's over rich. He's got popularity from the get-go. Partly he's not Yeltsin. He's young, he's vital, he does judo, he can speak. Political Russian, uh, intellectual Russian, but he can also talk street. When he's talking about the Chechen rebels, he can, he, he, uh, he, you know, he says, we'll go, we'll go in and knock them into the shale. You know, see, literally, in, uh, in the Russian equivalent of that. And uh, make very, uh, you know, just very uh, tough language that is bracing because he can try to combine what we call gravitas, see, he was in the seriousness in Russian with a sense of vitality and purpose and purpose. And, of course, there's those oil prices. He rides a tide of rising oil prices and brings word to Russians. Consumer economy booms. And then starting around 2004, we start him see the move first against uh, uh, Khodorkovsky, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the uh, owner of the uh, 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 who he puts into arrest. Uh, Khodorkovsky was only released about two and a half years ago. Uh, starts moving against the Chechens very hard uh, and starts asserting Russia's position, first getting into the G30, the G7, G8, and then 2008, Georgia, or Russia, picks a fight. In the meantime, he's fortifying a strip to the, between Moldova and Ukraine called Transnistria, Zadnistroya, which is sort of a, a quasi state. Just like the belt of states currently around the north and east and west edge of Georgia. Uh, he is obviously upset when in 2004 the Orange Revolution takes place in Ukraine, the first Maidan. And he starts to complain more and more loudly about lack of attention to Russian interests and Russian stature. And this is part of what we're seeing mature by 2000, uh, when, when Sochi 2012, uh, no, yeah, 2012. Uh, 2014, uh, with the success of Maidan in Ukraine and the government, and we see, you know, in rational terms, the way we see it, Sochi was such a success, and he restored a lot of goodwill between the Alps. And right at the end of Sochi, we see the little green men, the white men, go to Crimea, and within three weeks, Crimea, Crimea is part of Russia. That summer, forces move into eastern Ukraine, and very quickly after that, that Dutch plane is brought back, right? And so, boom. But, what is new? He has actively cultivated popular support. In a way that I, I tell my students, this is in the absolute given toolbox. Your ideal is you're achieve, achieving that goal of modernity and competitiveness and parity with the more advanced powers. You want the citizens involved in you. You want them to become modern <coughs> and with you. You want them to understand how this benefits them and their society, and how the society and the state's benefit actually redounds to their benefit and and, uh, and advancement, right? And so you want them as willing partners. You want them to do this willingly. You don't want to coerce them. And so what Putin has done is to cultivate. They have their elections to Duma, not always free and fair. Nonetheless, I do believe polls say he's got 70 to 75% approval, maybe. 
And I can't think of an American politician or Canadian politician of whatever political persuasion that would not start contemplating the murder of family members if she or he could achieve 75 years of <laughs> age. Uh, but he's given them a great cultural program. All the major rock acts go through Russia. Uh, he has also elevated the church, the big winner in the last 30 years that nobody's talked about. Is received back all of its property, property the Bolsheviks confiscated, is a, it, it, and is an ardent supporter of the, of the, the government. Uh, so he found ways to involve the population and make them feel like they own Russia's greatness as well. After the ca capture of Crimea, everybody wore a service ribbon that was very popular. It was widespread after World War II because people got it for serving under arms. The George ribbon, orange and black stripes. That became a symbol of Russia's recruitment. And that summer, wherever you went, cabbies had it hanging from their, their mirrors, and young men would be walking down the street with this on the you'd see bouquets of orange and black flowers. Like Russians felt ownership, especially, and then this all comes to a climax in 2015, the celebration <coughs> of the 70th anniversary of the victory. Again, Russia's achievement. And he and Putin distanced himself from the communists and said this was a so he's given a lot of people pride that has allowed them to ride out our sanctions. Um, at the same time, he singled out guys, my friends, the chattering classes, who I can still read their websites, I can still see this and stuff, there's still papers that are critical of the government, but I and my ten friends are the only people who read them. <laughs> but, and, but we saw this in Great Britain in the 1980s with Margaret Thatcher. She just said, leave the chattering class to themselves. Nobody listens to them anyway. Let them say what they want. And there's a point, there, there's something to that. Right? But this, this state has given a lot of people desperate for something, something they can want, especially outside the capitals, because there's a huge disparity between capital city Russia and provincial Russia, as there was under the Soviet history system, but in a very different key nowadays. Um, and he's managed to package things much more adeptly than Soviet propaganda ever did. If you ever get a chance, watch Russian television, RT. Uh, don't believe any of it, but watch it. It's extremely, it's extremely adroitly done. And he, you know, and they've got their fingers on the pulse, but you know, uh, of, of popular culture. Cyber warfare, a great example. And it tells us something about how we've got to rethink power. It isn't always the wrong person, it's the best coder. And if there was anything Russians were good at because of rummy computer technology, they were great programmers, they were great shortcuts, they were great Tetris, right? Tetris was designed on a computer that uh, would be blown to bits by the original Atari system, I think it was Atari uh, or Sega that they, they sold it on. Uh, they just knew how to connect. That's why Russian mathematicians were also great, because there was no other sort of political figure who had to do it. And so, he has created a new power that involves society in a way that a Stalin or Khrushchev never would have thought of, and Nicholas II would have been afraid to, and Peter the, Peter the First would never have thought of because he didn't think they were ready for it yet. But he's also made it clear the state is in charge, you are an adjunct, you are a partner, you are a supporter, and if, any, if we don't, aren't going to be here, it's going to both be, I'm using the Russian word, liberasts. And there's a strong Nationalist streak, a very strong conservative streak. And the last sort of element of this asymmetrical warfare is we can talk about the election of here. I'm not so sure, but you know, we're we're obviously aware of this. But his effort to cultivate allies in neighboring Europe. Marine Le Pen, apparently the throne that said, and is getting money. Victor Orban in Hungary. Whoever would have thought Hungarian politics? after 56, would have been making sweet with uh, a Russian leader, right? Their German party is receiving money. He has a Congress of Values, family values in Petersburg every year, where we see these, even a guy uh, who fancies himself the leader of the California Separatist Party, uh, uh, it, who teaches school in somewhere in, uh, in the Euros. So, uh, but, so we're seeing that, uh, and so we're even seeing on the cheap, 
I'm not sure that Putin really thinks he can disrupt. I don't think, for instance, they, they had any idea they could disrupt American politics. I'm not sure they did. It wasn't for us. It was for his home audience. See how bereft and shackless these Democrats, these Democratic societies are. See how corrupt they are. We just got to sprinkle some money or some disinformation in them, and they all start yelling at each other. Uh, and it's always a, it's an argument against democracy. Right? And these arguments sound an awful lot to a Russian ear, like the contention and the bickering and the uh, strife of the 1990s. They don't want to remember the 1990s. As a matter of fact, another thing he's done is he's made the 1990s the symbol of what Russia was like. Not the Soviet period, for which there's a certain nostalgia. The 90s. No order. I'm giving you order, I'm giving you history. And that's his ability to reformulate the historical record to advertise his practice of statecraft. Now, I'm not going to go, to, I'm not going to make any predictions, but we can talk about that in two and a half, tried your patience long enough. But I just wanted to see if you're a Russian of a certain walk of life, like most Russians are, like people in most societies are, this is a society you know. You've got order now, there's certain predictability. Sure, you can't. You can't get French wine where you used to be able to, or you can't get common beer. Russians like cheese as much as the continent. <laughs> you can't get caviar, well, that's because before Putin came along, all the black marketeers fished out the Caspian. But you can get other things. And I've got a car, maybe it's a, you know, a, a two-seater Fiat, but I couldn't get a good enough speech under the old days. And this isn't the 1990s. You've got a leader, Russians respected. Uh, we're going to be hosting the World Cup, we'll be hosting the Olympics. Uh, Gergiev, conductor of the Petersburg Symphony, is a guest conductor with the Berlin Philharmonic and, uh, and the New York the Metropolitan Opera and all. Uh, Netrebka, the celebrates the piano in every Western opera, uh, knew that. And for many Russians, that's fine. Especially against the background of how they remember or think they remember. Uh, and so that's how, and I don't think, I think, I'm not even sure it's Putin. I think Putin, is, and I'll finish with that, is ultimately probably a broker among a bunch of contending factions, each of which have a different product, sort of power. The coercive agencies like the secret police and the border police, the armed forces, which are surprisingly unpolitical and always have been, another continuity. Um, economists. And if you want a, uh, a canary in the coal mine, uh, there's, he's got an old friend named Kudrin, K-U-D-R-I-N, who is now a senior economic consultant to the government and is as liberal in the Russian sense as the day is long. And is an old Leningrad slash Petersburg friend of Putin uh, and can still say very critical things about the government in the press that the Russian, that most Russians would read. Um, so you've got the economists, and then you've got sort of the money people. And they support, they all support him because they trust him. A lot of them are his pals. What are sources of unrest? Well, the Ukraine thing. I don't think they want to run Ukraine. I, you know, nobody. I, I think what they want to do is to remind us, hey, Ukraine's our backyard. And we know what you did in Poland. You put those missiles there saying they were aimed at Iran. Right? Well, what if one of them doesn't make it wrong? Where's it going to land, right? Uh, uh, you know, a lot of this is political posturing, because you can do it. But Ukraine, they don't want to run that. I don't think they, I don't think they want to run the Baltics. Uh, they certainly don't want to run the Caucasus. No Russian government's ever had a good time there. And uh, Central Asia, there are easier ways to get to the border. But they do want recognition, they do want respect. Uh, what will tell us how powerful Putin was is what happens when he leaves the seat of these Russian brothers and wrestlers. And that's going to be the interesting thing. What becomes of Russia after Putin? Which is the question we all read. My predecessors asked, what will become of Russia after Stalin? What will become of Russia after Brezhnev? What will become of Russia after Chernenko? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, after Gorbachev. Something always survives, and that's what goes older. Conventions and trying to understand both statecraft, structure, power, interest, and law, or what we've been to the right. But to then
understand it is absolutely natural and they love their country when they sing the anthem just as much as we do when we sing ours. And we're not going to make any headway with these guys until we understand it. I really try your patience. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Well, that, no, that's uh, certainly right now, uh, and that's why World War II has become so important as memory that they've really played up since the imposition of the sanctions. And the sanctions are pretty tough. Uh, that's, a real, that's a real choice that against That, and they'll say, and, and what they'll also say, remember, here we have the greatest generation, thanks to Tom Brokaw, and, the, you know, how, and we've got the, uh, the, the fights to Washington the, uh, for the bets and all that, and the, the World War II Memorial Navy. We, we sort of rediscovered, uh, the American side rediscovered uh, a, a certain uh, martial virtue, right? That they're that, you know, it's fully recovered from Vietnam. Uh, with, with the Russians, World War II, it's, one cannot convey to a North American audience or to most European audience the privations Russia went through. Like, I studied in Leningrad in 1975. I dated a girl whose mom had lived through the blockade. And and you read about, but hearing, uh, hearing a woman who's probably the age I am now talk about it as an experience was just mind-boggling. And every family's got a story like that, right? And so, the line becomes, so you're complaining because you can't get to a lobby town there? Think about your grandparents. Think what they went through. And in some ways, uh, for those of a certain age, uh, depending what part of the continent from, you're from, I dim echo would be uh, if people live through the Dust Bowl. Right? Uh, and uh, say, the cotton rubble would get really hard by the Dust Bowl. And you can know, you know when you're when you're dealing with natives, because you go in, you go get a, they tell you to get a cup down to pour some coffee, cup's upside down. Because the dust is gathered in the winter and that. Well, that's, a, that's just a pale example that you, that they've had the experience of World War II drilled in them so deeply, because it really was truly a moment of national achievement, almost despite the state, that you're going you're gonna to whine over some sanctions. This is nothing. Think of what they went through. And they found, in, in some ways, it's encouraged the Russians to start addressing seriously, not only successfully, their domestic agricultural problems, which has always been, since the Soviet state created collective farms, it's always been the Achilles heel. And the, the great stumbling block of that, of that society and that economy. So um, I'm saying it's going to take more than that. Uh, and stability, yes. Uh, will you take order over as a primary virtue? Yes, because you're still remembering the anarchy of the night. So, yeah, you, you've got the right people. Yeah, <coughs> Dick. As a professional. <laughs> but uh, I think it doesn't hurt to be Canadian. Because <laughs> the skin of the game is very different. Yes? Is Russian health on the decline? Or oh, yes. Uh, do they have a health care system? They do. Uh, it's better than Zimbabwe's. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's. It's not great if you've got money in this. Uh, they've certainly got a good medical profession, but the medical profession, outside of certain specialties that serve, serve the, the, the gerontological pathologies of the leadership of the last three generations of the Soviet Union, so uh, 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 vascular physicians, uh, cardiologists, uh, neurologists dealing with strokes and other types of things, they were always had very good specialists in that. GPs, though, uh, and, you know, for all that we heard about women's equality and so on, GPs were the female profession. And the female profession was not seen as being in the same. You went to high specialties, they were all male. But nowadays, no, uh, it's catch as catch can for medical care. And the system's collapsed to the point where male life expectancy, even in Moscow, is something like 56 years old. 
And that's not just vodka and cigarettes, and it's all sorts of things, but it's a lot of vodka and cigarettes. Um, <laughs> and it's something that I did really appreciate, but I remember walking down the street in Petersburg about four years ago, and I saw a lot of guys, I saw a lot of younger guys, and I'd see a few older guys. Uh, and I, at that time I was 58 or so, I didn't see any more years. I was having a few friends, and I'm going, oh, smoke, yeah, th th this is what happened. So, uh, no, health isn't very good, and they're really concerned about that uh, natality through birth rates. They're trying to frantically to get birth rates up because they don't want immigration. They already have social pressure. They're relying on immigrants from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan to be the, the physical labor, if you sound familiar. And, uh, 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 and, and Muscovites won't take those positions, but these people are subject to vicious racism. And, uh, but there's nobody in Russia doing jobs for them. Uh, their population is too so it's a you no know, the demographic crisis is real and they're trying all sorts of things right. and doesn't seem to be responding yet. Yes. Um, two. One is the continued decline in oil prices and how that's going to continue to affect their economy. And the second one is Syria. What is? Huh. I don't understand their obsession or whatever okay. with Syria. Uh, did you that's basically what she said. No. Uh, uh, one, the first question was, what's the impact of continued decline of oil prices? And the second is, what's up with Syria? Fair? Okay. The oil prices, well, again, if somebody has a lot of savings in Canadian dollars, I'd be following that very intently. Uh, the Canadian dollar has gone down from the mid-90s or high 90s to 74 in the last three years. And now, it's tracked oil, the ruble has really tracked oil down. But in that way, the sanctions become a knife in the water because people Sorry. don't want to spend all the money on the imported goods, which have gone up, they doubled in price over the last four years. Um, I'd say $50 oil, they were budgeting for $100 oil per barrel, now they're budgeting for $40, and they're getting $50, uh, and uh, they have certain captive markets, and so, that's not quite the threat in the short term that it was. But in the long term, they're not exploring alternative energies. Uh, uh, they're trying to, you know, they're like a lot of these mono economies that uh, uh, try to cash in on this resource at the cost, especially given such a creative and, 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 and highly accomplished scientific community, a lot of whom now are doing a brain drain of their own. They don't need the hassle of working with these guys. Uh, they're sort of losing the potential to develop all sorts of alternative economies. So that's it. Syria, there's two things. What one, since 48, the Soviet Union and its successors have felt themselves players in the Middle East. There's a reason for that too. Like uh, look where Russia is compared yeah. to us. Right? But Afghanistan, you think that would have scared them off enough? Um Nobody since Alexander the Great seems to be scared off by <laughs> Afghanistan, in spite of the abject failure of each invader. Uh, like, like, you know, Bloodletting is a national sport to make the Highland Scots look like uh, cricket players. But, uh, um, but Syria, Syria is also their only enduring ally. They've always had very close ties with them. They've got that naval base on the coast. Syrians let them use. And the interesting thing you could say Syria, you could say Libya. Remember, I talked about the state and this view of the state. Putin made, agree with it or not, he made an interesting point when the U.S. wanted to bring the Syria crisis to the Security Council and authorize some sort of armed intervention against Assad, right? And Putin said, and basically, what he basically said was, or not Putin, his representative, the recently deceased ambassador, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, representing the Russian government's point of view, essentially said, look, you can't break a state. You break a state, what do you have in this, what do you have in this aftermath? What happened in Iraq, they say? You, know, you broke down all these, and these guys think like people who grew up in a society of networks and overlapping in and out of uh, official power. You, you ruptured and disrupted fundamentally all these networks in the hopes of achieving a certain type of constitutional settlement it might work for you, but it doesn't work in society like this. What happened in Libya, they said? Why would we do this in Syria? Then it was the whole Middle East. Right? And notice, 
I mean, it's, it's an alliance, it's a relationship I've been waiting for to, to develop for 20 years. Turkey and Russia are starting to develop a rapprochement for the first time in three and a half centuries. But but over this issue, how do you, and so to us it's agonizing because Assad is just a brutal thug, and this is a corrupt, self-interested regime. Uh, on the other hand, is Israel safer next to a stable, predictable, tyrannical dictatorship, mm-hmm. or to this maelstrom, the war of all, you know, this Hobbesian scenario of uh, ultimate tribalism, and you know, in Iran, creeps in, right? And, and the one player is a, the only sort of partisan political thing I'll say is the. It's always struck me as ironic. The only players <laughs> outside the Israelis that like us, the Americans, Dick, uh, that like the Americans in there and, and and want them to be there and want their support are the Kurds, right? <laughs> Kurds in Turkey, northern Syria, northern Iraq, and western Iran, and, uh, and Kurdistan is the only one of these peoples after World War One that did not get their own state. And of course, we can't. NATO can't do anything about that because then you're huge disruption. So now Syria, it's uh, partly the larger game of showing their great power, but partly protecting an ally and partly a defense of a certain approach to maintaining regional stability in a volatile region. And one that we would call realpolitik. We might not like it, but it's the the least noxious of a series of really noxious ones. Yeah. Oh, that's right, you ma'am. I don't think the Chinese and Indians would consider themselves part of the same deal either. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I understand. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that 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 that
then if I'd had time, I'd talk to a guy named Alexander Dugan, who Putin sort of gives free reign to, who makes precisely the same. Russia, he survived this idea of Eurasianism, that Russia is, it, it's its own culture that straddles both Asia, whatever that is, and Europe. And it's a new way over the decadent materialist West and the soporific uh, sleeping orange. <laughs> I think they'll muddle along. I think they always have. I think they'll muddle along, and I think they always have. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I would bet on Putin outlasting Orban and outlasting Yogi. Uh And I think with Europe right now, and with a lot of what's triggered things in Europe now is less Russian. Russians are riding an opportunistic wave because this huge wave of refugees that's being unleashed on Europe by the news. I mean, that's, that's a wild card that we don't want to talk about, but that has been incredibly disruptive. Do you want to explain Brexit or uh, uh, the Pen viability or Jovic and, uh, and Fides and that? It's, uh, so, uh, no, I see your point, but I'd say national culture isn't quite as stable as we say, but national institutions often are. Uh, so, I can't be hopeful, but I, I think we're being, I think we're being, you know, how viable is democracy in Hungary? How viable is what we think of as constitutional democracy in Hungary right now? We don't know. Yeah. True. Exactly. My point, uh, I saw a question. Sorry, I, other people want to ask. Yes. Through this lens that you've been talking about, Russia. Lately, we've had a, a change in the chattering classes. We've been talking a lot about it here in our own country. What's happened here? Yeah. And, and but there's been a lot of analysis and so forth, but no prescriptions on how how we might make a difference with the accelerating change we have both socially and technologically here in this country. And how people are getting left out. What would you say from about that? Uh, For this through, country, through your through your lens of having studied Russia, but how could that be? Together. Uh, in this country, um, I'll tell you, uh, I won't quote myself, I'll quote my father. Uh, my father died three and a half years ago, but uh, he always encouraged me to move down to this country. We, we did his residency here, and uh, we lived in Denver for three years when I was a kid. Loved the States. Loved baseball. Loved pro sports. Loved jazz. When we lived in New York, we'd come down to visit three, four times a year. He was at this point when I married to go from my hometown, who he loved. I was just rather an American girl. And, uh, and we're sitting on a dock in a lake, if you know where Lake, lake of the Woods is, about <coughs> uh, well, three miles west of Lake of the Woods on the Ontario Manitoba border. Beautiful evening, milky way up above, and all the rest of it. And uh, we're, we get the White Sox on the free field because of the incursion where drinking beer, believe it or not, in Canada. And, uh, uh, and we're talking, and all of a sudden he says, you know, Dave, I sort of feel sorry for you living in that country right now. And I was like, what? <laughs> all this, and I said, okay, why? He said, this summer of 93, he says, for half a century, they were united against a common adversary that spanned both parties. This threat posed by the Soviet Union, that threat's gone, and what's going to be united now? And we've looked, we've tried to run drugs, we tried to war on terror, now I'm speaking for myself, and I'm speaking for the university or for Russian news. I'm not being special. I'm being somebody who's lived and paid taxes in this country for a long time. Tried to war on drugs, tried to war on terror, uh, war on this, war on that. And we don't seem to be any closer in the community. I don't know what it's going to be. And it's very distressing because, uh, as an imperial, as a student of imperial Russia, what I can see in the late period of the Russian Empire is every discussion becomes about the very bases of the system. That every system becomes, is, every question becomes, is the autocracy viable or not? And the liberals will say it isn't, because history is in, and conservatives say this is the only thing that has made Russia what it is. And these become huge differences, like almost different, qualitatively different responses to seeing the same thing. And I'm afraid to see signs of that here, but that could be, but I don't trust my judgment on this because I'm living <coughs> and I'm responding to it. And I'm obviously engaged with it. Uh, uh, I'm very punctilious, but my students have a clue wherever my sympathies might lie. Uh, but watching it uh, from that perspective, 
Yeah, you can't help but be distressed. On the other hand, something we always lose sight of is uh, an audience like this, uh, we're likely to meet socially. Right? We don't live in the same part of town as that, but we likely end up in some of the same areas. And one way or another, conversation goes politics. <laughs> and we, most of you, how many still get the newspaper? Yeah. And how many of you check out, say, the New York Times and Washington Post online? Um, like, we're political consumers. And in a way, that's part of the separation. We, uh, Kathy Fan, I'd love to hear Kathy. Uh, she serves on the same committee as I did for uh, the Chancellor Service. She's, you're going to love her. Fantastic figure. I couldn't recommend her highly enough. But we are all very actively engaged politically. We're, 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 we consume it. We've got the leisure too. We've got the education too. We've got the, the, the train curiosity. A lot. I go home to my hometown, and most of my pals, they're quite well informed, but they've got other things. They've got kids, they've got their jobs. If you're living somewhere where you're going after your daily bread, you don't really have time to think about these things. Or we know from voting rates, a lot of people don't think of, even during election, what was the turnout in November? 53, 55%. For a national presidential election. And in a way, that's a sign of hope because there's enough people out there that don't really care. <laughs> but, that there's, but there's an America that they respond to and believe in. That you see them with their hand on their heart, with the flag. There are things they do respond to and believe in. That there are things that make the country and make the politics and society that are different from our sort of more legalized engagement with it. So that, that's my blindly optimistic. And the only thing I'll say about American politics. You want to talk about hockey on your guys? I think we probably have to cut it off there. But um, thank you to uh, Professor McDonald.